Kaczynski and welcome to tonight's Expert Angle webinar where we will be discussing CALM, a program designed for patients and caregivers to help patients with advanced cancer deal with distress. CALM addresses four main domains including managing symptoms and communicating with your healthcare providers, managing changes to yourself and your relationships with others, spiritual well-being and maintaining a sense of purpose and preparing for the future. And our speaker is Dr. Sarah Hale. My name is Namira, and I'm the Health Promotion Specialist in the Research, Health Promotion, and Survivorship Department at Prostate Cancer Canada. And I will be moderating today, tonight's webinar. So we'll just start with a few housekeeping items and a few ground rules. The expert angle team will attempt to answer as many questions as possible and we will answer your questions during the Q&A period at the end of the webinar. Only participants with access to a PC during the webinar will be able to ask questions by typing them in the text box in their control panel. All attendees are automatically placed on mute to allow for the best quality audio. Asking questions. Okay, so I'd like, now like to introduce you to today's guest speaker, Dr. Sarah Hales. Dr. Hales is a psychiatrist and coordinator of psychiatry services within psychosocial oncology and palliative care at Princess Margaret Cancer Center. Her research has been funded by both the Canadian Cancer Society and the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Her clinical and research interests include the end of life experience as it affects both patients and families and psychotherapeutic interventions aimed at alleviating distress in those facing advanced disease. So I'd now like to turn it over to Dr. Sarah Hale. Well, th thank you so much, uh, Namira. Uh, I, I want to just say to everyone, I have, I have done something like this once before, and it's a very odd experience because I'm in a room with the door closed, and I feel like I'm talking to myself. <laughs> Uh, I also usually speak with my hands a lot, and so I'm, I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to communicate as clearly as I would like, um, given that you can't see me. And I also usually like to see the audience, because then I can tell if people are falling asleep, if they look confused or frustrated in some way, and, and adjust accordingly. So um, I, I, I just have to apologize for not being able to use all of those tools. I hope that this is going to be nonetheless interesting to those of you that, that ha are taking the time to, to log on. Uh, as Namira mentioned, you know, the, the, the goal of this is really to share with you research that, that the team that I work with has been doing around trying to provide uh, psychological support to patients who have advanced uh, cancer. I, I felt a little bit that the, that the advertisement about the talk was a bit misleading. I hope that people haven't logged on thinking that after the, this next hour they're going to walk away knowing how to uh, manage their cancer and live meaningfully. Um, but perhaps we'll have begun the process of thinking uh, about what some of the research shows around these domains and perhaps um, I can explain to you w what we're doing in order to try to help people to do that through interventions such as the one I'm going to describe today. Uh, I find talking to, um, to non-medical groups um, who have an interest in cancer and cancer support to be um, selfishly very valuable to me because I, I really value people's input into what we're doing here. A lot of the conversation, as you're probably aware, in academic medicine is, is academics talking to academics and what gets missed is touching base with the people that, we are, that cancer touches personally and, and getting their input on, on what we're trying to do. So I'm very interested in whether what I'm talking about um, resonates with you, whether uh, you think that this kind of treatment is needed, uh, and that it does fill a gap in terms of your experience and if it's something you're interested in. So I'm going to talk a bit about emotional distress in general in, in those who have advanced disease and how this is often undetected and, and untreated by, by medical caregivers. I'm going to talk a bit about this intervention called Managing Cancer Living Meaningfully or CALM, which we've developed here at, at the Princess Margaret that intends to 
focus on that distress by touching on four main domains that we feel are, are causes of that distress, and Namira touched on those, and I'll talk about them in some more detail. And then I'm going to present some of the preliminary research we have about this intervention and how it can help uh, patients. I, just, I do want to, before I begin, um, alert you to the fact that I am a sort of representative and spokesperson for a very large team of both clinicians uh, and researchers here at the Princess Margaret, uh, and also now internationally we have some partners. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to use we a lot, and when I use we, I'm referring to this very large group of people that I work with who are all part of this research. So it, this is not only my, my brainchild. Uh, so this, this intervention that we developed really grew out of uh, many years of working clinically uh, with patients of advanced disease who get re referred to our program. We have a psychosocial oncology program here at the Princess Margaret. And we found that what we were doing was often uh, seeing patients, uh, sometimes with a family member, for uh, a few sessions. And we were talking about very similar uh, topics and working with them in very similar ways. and and what we ended up talking about really fit with a lot of our the research we knew was out there about the advanced cancer experience. And we realized that there, there was really nothing in the literature to um, support in terms of evidence the kind of uh, intervention we were providing. And so we decided to manualize what we were doing. And, and we haven't really created something drastically new, but we've tried to put it together in a coherent, uh, structured way so that we could research it uh, and prove to uh, society at large that this is valuable, that this is worth funding, that this is helpful to patients and families, and also so that we could teach it to other clinicians who want to work with this population but really weren't sure um, what to do. So that's that's a reason for the, the manualization. As I mentioned, this this intervention is really based on our, res our research and clinical experience with patients who have advanced um, uh, cancers. And what we find is, as you can imagine, they ha are struggling in a lot of different areas. Um, in terms of that top circle, symptom management and communication with healthcare providers, we know that patients with advanced disease are often living with a lot of physical symptoms, often multiple physical symptoms at one time or fluctuating symptoms over time, and that these can be quite chronic uh, and sometimes are slowly advancing in terms of intensity and frequency. And they're often very involved with the healthcare uh, system. So they're often coming regularly for checkups. They're involved in treatments. Um, they're coming to hospital. They're seeing physicians and nurses a great deal. And so that aspect of navigating the healthcare system is another big source of potential distress uh, for patients. The green circle touches on the relational aspect of having an advanced disease. So patients talk a lot about the difficulties they have in terms of how they've changed in relationships because of their cancer and how they feel those around them have changed. Some of this is about roles, in, for instance, in families, if people are no longer able to partner or, or, or parent in the way that they used to because of physical or illness limitations. Um, and there's also a changes in, in uh, interpersonal needs that illness raises. So people who, for instance, have never needed a lot of care may need more emotional or physical support from those around them. So there's a lot of adjustments that are happening in, a, in the relational realm that can contribute to distress for advanced cancer patients. On the left side of this, uh, see I'm using my hands. <laughs> see what I'm, where I'm pointing. On the left side here, the, the spirituality sense of, of, uh, sense of meaning and purpose domain is also an area that uh, is related to a lot of distress. Uh, patients will talk about not being able to do the things that used to bring meaning and purpose in their lives. For a lot of people, for instance, this can be work, um, what they, their ability to um, be busy in a profession or career. This could be, um, again, the ability to parent in the way that they are used to. Um, they, may be, they may have questions or their spirituality may be challenged by their illness experience. And so this is, can also be uh, an area of distress for, for patients. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, um, and most uniquely when you talk about advanced and life-threatening disease is this, this domain uh, at the bottom, the future hope and mortality. So for patients that have a diagnosis of advanced cancer, the, the threat of mortality is very much on the horizon for them and really colors 
often uh, many aspects of, of life so that the, the, the fact of uncertainty is really um, heightened for, for this population. Certainly we're all facing mortality, but it becomes much more real when you have um, a serious and life-threatening uh, diagnosis. So these are the complicated problems. The other, I think, important uh, issue is this idea of what we call a tipping point. So more and more patients are living with advanced and metastatic cancers for many years. Certainly prostate cancers, breast cancers, a lot of gastrointestinal cancers. People can be living for decades with these illnesses. So they're certainly struggling in those four domains in the way that we mentioned, but if the illness is stable, uh, if they don't have a lot of symptomatology, if they're not involved in a lot of active treatment, they're often able to put a lot of those issues out of their minds. But what we find is that for our patients, there's, there can be tipping, a tipping point or many tipping points along their journey where a lot of these issues become much more salient. So this could be because of um, new symptoms, uh, a sudden uh, uh, change for advancement in disease, uh, transitions in care, new treatments, et cetera, where patients are suddenly uh, plunged into more distress in those domain areas. And we find are often interested in obtaining more support uh, around those issues. So we found that that at that tipping point, there's what we are describing as a sort of therapeutic opportunity. Um, I see in my practice here as a psychiatrist a lot of patients who have never seen a therapist before and never seen a psychiatrist in their past, never needed to, but in the in the context of having a life-threatening illness those issues that I that I highlighted previously, they are very help-seeking. And they have an increase in what we call reflective functioning. So uh, um, they are more, they're thinking more about some very deep issues in their lives than perhaps they did before they were plunged into this new situation. Often these patients too, I, I find, have a really heightened need for authenticity. Um, for straight talk and for honesty and confronting uh, the realities of their situations and are frustrated when um, healthcare providers or friends or family members provide platitudes about their situation or try to dismiss their concerns or say things like, try to stay positive, um, don't worry. Uh, they recognize that there is a problem that they're facing and they often want support in talking about it and they need people to be straight with them about the situation. And also related to, to this issue of, of uh, mort pending mortality, there can be a sense of motivation and urgency to maybe address issues in life that have been um, there for quite a long time, but they thought they would get to dealing with those problems in the future. And the sense of having a horizon suddenly adds a sense of urgency to dealing with those issues. So as I mentioned, it's this situation that brings a lot of patients to my clinic um, and leads to my involvement in their care. That said, I really think that this situation doesn't necessarily need professional therapeutic help. And there are a lot of patients that have metastatic or advanced cancers and get this kind of support in managing distress through very close relationships and family family and friends, they may get it from a spiritual care provider, they may get it from peers who also have had a cancer experience. And so not everybody, um, I don't think everybody needs uh, professional therapy, but some people do and some people do want that outlet and aren't don't feel comfortable or able to access that support in other ways. So I'm going to talk about the kind of uh, therapy that I, we try to provide that addresses some of these problems. Um, provided by, by psychosocial professionals. So our rationale in, in creating this intervention was, as I had mentioned, really to, to manualize something that we were doing uh, that was based on evidence and clinical experience so that we could research it and educate people about it and be clear and specific about what we were doing that was helpful to patients. We really wanted it uh, to be manualized, but we also wanted it to be very flexible. So we wanted to be able to uh, individualize it for the needs of a patient. So we didn't want a sort of scripted um, uh, therapy. We didn't we didn't uh, specifically design something that was self-help, that was online, for instance, and educational. We really wanted to be able to tailor it to the needs of individuals. 
uh, we wanted it to be uh, focused on those domain areas that I, I talked about and really to be able to address both the practical issues of, uh, for instance, disease management, but also to be able to address some of the really profound issues around sense of meaning and purpose and, and uh, yeah, you know, life closure and death preparation if necessary. So we really wanted to be able to move back and forth between practical and profound topics. And also we wanted to see whether we could do something that was brief. Um, this is really for a variety of reasons, I think. One is certainly uh, limitations in terms of healthcare resources. We're fairly rich here uh, at the Princess Margaret in terms of what we have available, but there are the majority of cancer patients treated across Canada are individuals who don't have access to a specialized psychiatrist. Uh, they may have access to a social worker or a nurse or a palliative care physician. So we wanted something that could be brief enough to be um, realistically provided in a lot of different uh, contexts. And we also recognize, recognize that patients of advanced disease are often not interested in something intense and long term. They, they have a lot of other issues they're dealing with. They're managing their illness. They often don't want to be coming for a longer therapy. So we wanted to see whether we could do something brief in a very few sessions. So what we had des designed is something that is four to six sessions. Uh, it's a traditional therapeutic hour, and we're trying to deliver that over a six-month period. We don't formally end the therapy. We, we have what we call additional booster sessions that are available later if patients need them. So there, we don't really close the door on ongoing therapy, uh, recognizing that patients often want to come back and connect with a the therapist again if needed. Uh, and the other uh, aspect of the therapy that uh, that we really emphasize is that we we hope that patients will bring in uh, an informal caregiver, whoever they identify as their primary caregiver, to one or more of the sessions. And we found that to be really important in terms of helping that dyad anticipate what lies ahead and work together to manage it. Um, as, as people are probably aware, the cancer experience is really a family experience. Um, patients are not isolated in that experience, and the family unit is often affected. Uh, and it's important to attend to those issues and be really supporting that unit in moving forward and, and managing the illness. So we really try to work with that, that in mind. I'm not going to get too theoretical. Um, uh, but I do want to touch on what some of the foundations of the therapy are um, because this is kind of unique in some ways. Um, we, this, this therapy is, is really based on three main theor theories. One is existential theory, relational theory, which is a kind of uh, psychological um, psychotherapy theory, and attachment theory. I'm not going to talk about the, the, the last two in any great detail. Um, any of you who are therapists out there who would like to know more about it are welcome to, to contact me. But I'm going to talk on, about existential theory because I think this is really important in terms of how it's informed the therapy and what makes it a bit different, I think, from often what people think of when they think of psychological treatment. Existential theory uh, really, um, really came along, uh, along with existential uh, um, philosophy and therapists working with patients started to touch on a lot of these ideas in their work. And, and what they were really talking about was the fact that there are what, what, what therapists have called the givens of human existence that can cause distress for people. Um, Irvin Yalom is a, a real pioneer in this area, and he was a psychiatrist who uh, he is a psychiatrist who worked in California often with a lot of cancer patients, and really wrote the initial textbook called Existential uh, Therapy. And he talked about four main areas that people may experience conflict in. And he talked about the experience of having advanced disease as actually highlighting problems in all of these four domains. He talked about the issue of death. Uh, he talked about the tension between p our wish to live and the knowledge that we will all die, that there's an inherent conflict in that situation for all people, but, but having an advanced illness brings, makes that people more aware of that. Um, and I certainly see that in, in the patients that I work with who are often really struggling to both to live with the knowledge that they can die. Uh, again, a, a situation that we all face, no matter whether we have a, an illness or not, but when we have, when someone has a life-threatening diagnosis, it becomes more real, and they're often struggling with with uh, managing that tension. Um, 
He talked about a conflict around freedom, the fact that we want, in a way, to know how to live our lives, but we may not have a sense of direction or rules about that. And I see that a lot in my patients who ask questions about if you know, have they lived their life correctly. Um, they may also have questions about treatment. You know, what should I do moving forward? Should I, for instance, the question around should I fight? Or should I accept that I'm dying? And these questions really touch on an issue of freedom that there's no, we have no guidelines around this. There's no right way, uh, per se, to, to manage having an advanced illness. He talked about um, the conflict related to isolation, that having a, an advanced illness, people often feel isolated from others, feel as though this puts them in a different category and that people can't understand their experience, and yet at the same time may have a very deep need and wish to connect with other people and fight that sense of isolation, and there's an inherent tension there. And then finally, in terms of meaninglessness, trying to understand why this is happening in life. What is the value? Uh, what is of value in the face of death? What is the potential purpose of suffering? How, trying to make meaning out of something that seems perhaps meaningless uh, on the face of it. So, so what he was writing about and what these theorists were write, have been writing about for many decades really touches on the kind of questions and topics that I'm talking with my patients a lot about in, in our sessions. And the other interesting thing about this theory is that it not only uh, relates to the content of our therapy, but it also relates to the goal. So people working in this field talked about the fact that these problems um, that I've outlined, these conflicts, are really not solvable conflicts. You know, as, as, a, as a psychiatrist, there's no there's no answer I can give to people to these around these questions. There's no quick fix. There's no problem solving these questions. Um, really, perhaps what our goal should be as therapists is to help people tolerate any anxiety or existential philosophers we call the angst that's generated by those by those conflicts and and awareness of them. And this is very different, I think, than when people think about a lot of treatment or they think about self-help or they think about uh, you know, tools for coping. We often think about sort of fixing the problem and eliminating distress. And what's different, I think, about the work that we've been doing with our patients is that, that we've really taken that goal out of the equation. We're not necessarily trying to rid people of all of their distress, but help them to tolerate and live with it. Uh, and I think that that has actually been quite liberating for therapists and for patients um, because I think when the expectation is to get rid of distress, people can often feel incredibly uh, hopeless about the therapeutic enterprise. And I think it's what often leads people to stop talking to, for instance, loved ones about their distress. If they have distress in these areas, it's a sense of, you know, what could, how could talking fix this? Uh, it's the reason I think often oncologists or physicians and nurses don't ask people about their distress, the idea that what would I say, what could I say to fix it. And, and so what we've been really trying to encourage uh, our patients to do and when we're teaching clinicians about this intervention, really teach and encourage people to think about expressing the distress and getting support in managing but not, but not necessarily um, getting rid of it altogether. I won't go into a lot of detail about the process of the therapy, um, but I will, I will just comment on the fact that the therapists that we are training are really trying to do multiple things in a very brief time. They're talking about, we're going to talk a bit about the content that they're discussing, but they're doing a lot of therapeutic work behind the scenes uh, in terms of developing a supportive relationship, helping people modulate or, or manage their affect, encouraging them to think deeply about the issues they're bringing forward, um, and uh, et cetera. I won't go into a lot of the detail about those, but um, I just want to highlight that there is there's sort of more more that's going on than, than uh, I, I might have time to, to discuss today. So the content of the therapy is really is based on those four domain areas that I have already mentioned. The, the idea is not that uh, we'll sort of have a script in terms of discussing them with patients. We'll really let patients uh, lead the way, and we'll talk about the issues that are most pressing or problematic for a particular patient at a particular time, and we're recognizing that the themes are intertwined, so patients and therapists can collapse them as they see fit. But all themes will be addressed at all, at some point, in all with all patients. So we will try to explore all of those topics, even if a patient isn't bringing them up necessarily. The therapist will try to inquire about all of them. 
So just to give you a flavor of some of the things that we might discuss in the therapy, so in terms of domain one, which is symptoms uh, and communication with healthcare providers, um, this was a uh, this was a patient who was a 54-year-old woman who had metastatic ovarian cancer who was in the therapy. And she, after being told that her clinical trial drug uh, was no longer available, she, she said to the therapist, um, what they forget is that this drug is keeping me alive. I care about other patients, and that's partly why I did this study, but I want to live for me and for my family. And for this patient, the experience of having a, a treatment no longer provided to her that she really felt was keeping her alive was a deeply distressing experience. It also shook her confidence and trust in her healthcare team, and she was very angry and disturbed by it. And this was the main focus of a lot of the sessions was, was coming to terms with this situation that something that she very much felt was of benefit to her individually was no longer uh, available. Um, so that gives you a flavor of the kind of uh, topics that will be discussed. We talk about the patient uh, with the patient about the di the disease itself and how they might manage symptoms. You know, um, or do they need the involvement of other healthcare providers? Do they need referral to other teams? We may be discussing with them how to navigate the system. We'll often discuss in great detail about treatment decision making. Um, patients often um, are very much wish that they had a, uh, a third party to talk about treatment decisions. I often feel oncology teams have something invested in particular decisions or family members might want them, uh, pressure them in one particular way or another. And so having, again, a neutral party to explore their treatment decisions, that can be very beneficial to them. Um, and then also we talk a lot about the relationship with their healthcare team and how to ensure they have the most collaborative relationship possible. Again, these are very intense relationships often that get generated and patients often uh, benefit from having someone to reflect on those relationships with. In terms of domain two, which is the self and relationships, um, this quote gives you a flavor, I think, of, of a very real concern that touches on this domain. This is a patient of mine who's a 32-year-old woman with metastatic breast cancer, and shortly after diagnosis, she asked me the question, you know, do cancer patients still fall in love? Which is a very poignant question, and really, I think, heightened, highlights how for this individual, uh, something that she had long hoped was in her future, the possibility of finding a partner and, and marrying. Um, suddenly that the, the, the fact that she might not have a long future ahead really became clear to her and there was more urgency about that and more wish and need for that kind of intimacy than she'd uh, acknowledged before. So in this, in, generally in this domain, we're often talking to patients about how their self-concept might have changed in the context of the illness, helping them to grieve losses if they've experienced those and how to recognize what strengths and abilities they still have. We may talk a lot about how cancer has altered the way they relate to individuals and the kind of needs that they might have. Um, and we, another topic that fits into this domain is around children and communicating with children around disease. And this is another uh, big issue of concern and distress often for patients, and we spend a lot of time talking about that. In terms of the third domain, spirituality, meaning, and purpose, um, this is a 30-year-old patient in the in the, or one of our studies, metastatic colon cancer, and she said, I, I feel like I found one love of my life, Paul, that was her husband, but I still haven't found that other love of my life, that thing that I'm meant to do that would give me an outlet to express myself completely. I worry I won't find it now. So in contrast to the previous patient quote, this is a woman who did have a life partner, but what she was searching for was a sense of purpose in her life, uh, a vocation, and again, a recognition that she might not have time to do that, and it was, she, there was grief about that potential, um, you know, potential loss. So in general, we're often exploring uh, personal meaning uh, of the cancer itself, of any suffering experience, personal meaning of the dying and death experience. We're often encouraging meaning making with, amongst patients as a way to deal with a situation that's beyond their control. So um, finding a way to, for some patients that's, that's the idea of a silver lining or benefit or positivity, but in other patients it can be making something useful out of their experience, leaving a legacy for loved ones, talking uh, you know, meaningfully with the people in their life, telling them they love one. These can all be, love them. This can all be ways that people try to make meaning of, of a, a traumatic experience. 
And then we also talk about uh, priorities and goals and how those may need to be reevaluated in the face of advanced disease and helping people maintain an active approach um, even to their last days. And then the societal domain, as I mentioned, is really, I think, one of the more most important in terms of this therapy, um, makes it, I think, fairly different from other kinds of therapies that we're talking very frankly with patients often about the future and how they're oriented towards it, their sense of hope and how, and their mortality. A 40-year-old woman with metastatic lung cancer is in the intervention said, I guess I need to accept it, but when I try, I just can't. I want to live and that's all. And often patients will talk about that feeling that they need to accept uh, death and dying and an inability to do that and, and a tension between their feeling that they very much want to live and yet awareness that, that this illness could end their life and the tension between those two is often something they struggle with. So as therapists, we're often um, focused on acknowledging and validating and normalizing their anxieties and anticipatory fears. Again, patients really often have very few outlets to talk frankly about their fears and situations, and people are often close down those conversations because they are distressing and then and and frightening. Uh, we want to encourage uh, really a balance of living and dying processes. So we've found that for patients, what is really most healthy is certainly acknowledging what lies ahead and preparing as best people can, but also focusing on living, focusing on their wellness, focusing on the day to day, and it's finding that uh, a balance between those two things that is often most adaptive for people. And to the extent that it's necessary, we're we're often talking to patients about advanced care planning and life closure and death preparation. Certainly not every patient in our intervention is interested in exploring this in great detail. And again, we talked about that tipping point at the beginning of the, the talk. And depending on where people are in their illness course, they may not be ready or may not be appropriate then for them to talk about this domain in great detail, but we are opening the door as therapists to patients discussing these issues uh, if they wish. This is a quote of a 24-year-old son of a patient who had advanced lung cancer who came for the treatment, and he said, you don't say much, but coming here helps me. It's like you're a heart with ears. And I think ultimately that's really what we're trying to teach our therapists to be, um, is to, uh, to listen and be supportive and help people to cope with the distress in those four domains uh, rather than fix it. Um, so this isn't a therapy where we as therapists have some magic that we can say that takes the problems away, but we're trying to create a therapeutic and supportive relationship that can help people cope with their distress. I'm just going to say a very brief amount about the the, the research findings. Um, we, we've completed and published a phase two trial of the intervention, and it was on a small number of patients, 38 in total, um, and a variety of solid tumor cancer sites. Uh, but what was really really heartening for us was to see, remember I, I said we sort of manualized this intervention, hoping that we could see whether it's of help to patients. And we were very pleased to see that over time, the patients enrolled in the intervention showed reduction in depressive symptoms. So what, that's what these, these are significant findings here in red. And basically, we, we found that there was a reduction in the depressive symptoms, an increase in their spiritual well-being, and a decrease in their death-related distress on self-report measures. And this is important, I think, given the fact that these are all patients of advanced disease and, and who, whose disease continues to advance over time, and yet we're seeing these changes in terms of their, uh, their scores, which is, is uh, pleasing. Uh, and, but perhaps more importantly, we've done some qualitative research with the, the individuals that have taken part in the intervention. And they talk about um, some of the benefits which we have found heartening. So they've talked about um, a few main uh, themes, the importance of having a safe place to process their experience of advanced cancer, um, freedom to talk about death and dying. Again, I talked about that a bit in that last domain, having license and a space to discuss it. Um, the third theme that came out of those interviews was having some assistance in navigating the illness uh, was very beneficial. Uh, the fourth ish, uh, theme was around resolution of relational strain, so benefiting in terms of their relationships from having a therapy that, that focused on how relationships had changed in the context of cancer. And then fifthly, and, and maybe I think most importantly, 
found the therapy an opportunity to be seen as a whole person within the healthcare system. And again, I think uh, more and more in cancer treatment, patients are are uh, uh, exposed to a lot of medical interventions. Uh, and uh, can often feel that what's being missed is, is being known as, as a whole person, not just their particular cancer. And so a therapy like this that gives people an opportunity to sit and talk about how the cancer experience has affected their whole life in all its dimensions um, can, be, can actually change the way patients experience the whole healthcare system. I also just want to uh, point out that we're in the midst of a randomized controlled trial of the study, so hope we'll have the findings within the next year that will be published, and I'm very much hoping that we see in this uh, a benefit. So this is a study where patients are randomized to receive the treatment or usual care, so we're very much hoping that we, can, we, see, we see benefit um, in the treatment arm compared to the uh, usual care arm. And then we're going to take over the world. Uh, <laughs> just to, I hope that something like Calm is going to be available uh, in a lot of different corners of Canada. Um, Prostate Cancer Canada in November uh, are, are supporting a Calm training program, a national training program. So we're hoping to train clinicians across Canada to be able to provide an intervention like this. Um, we've also been expanding it into other life-threatening illness populations. And we have colleagues working, for instance, in Huntington's disease, which is a, a terminal illness, um, uh, and adapt it to that population. We're trying to adapt it for different disciplines and healthcare professionals. So uh, adapt it for to be nursing delivered. Uh, we have a group in uh, working within the UK that are involved in that, but also we have a group of nurses here at, at the Princess Margaret who are being trained and trying to incorporate this into their practice. And then we've also been involved in adapting the intervention um, internationally, translating the manual. We have some colleagues and collaborators across um, the world, actually, who are in, interested in this intervention and applying it. So I think it's, what that's been very exciting that I think that a lot of these issues we're really finding are universal um, uh, in terms of uh, the cancer experience. So I, I want to have an opportunity, certainly, to take questions or comments. Um, I do want to, before we go to that, acknowledge, uh, first of all, the study participants and their families who have been involved in our research to date. Um, who are very important in this work, um, and certainly our funders. And I want you to include you to, uh, encourage you to keep calm and carry on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hales. Um, okay, so we're just going to take questions in a couple of minutes. But before we do that, if participants can just um, complete the poll so that we can see how many people were on the line. So just give you a few seconds to do that. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for doing that. Uh, so yes, just have a couple of questions, Dr. Hales. Um, how can patients find out a bit more about uh, this program or, or caregivers find out a bit more about it? So um, right now, we are, it is only um, really being offered here at the Princess Margaret. So for, for um, patients that are uh, being treated at the Princess Margaret, uh, they can be in contact with our psychosocial oncology department uh, and uh, express an interest in the therapy. And we actually are are always taking uh, new training cases for, for the therapists that we're training. And in terms of um, uh, those that are outside Princess Margaret, uh, it's coming <laughs> to you. Uh, hopefully soon, we've we are are um, beginning to offer a series of workshops over the next three years, and we actually have really an, an avalanche of interest from clinicians working in this area, as you can maybe imagine. Uh, there's, as I said, there's not a lot out there in terms of evidence-based uh, treatments for patients psychologically 
when they have advanced disease. And so people that are trying to support patients with, around these issues um, really are, are struggling for some guidance. So we've had a lot of interest from clinicians uh, from right across the country. And we're going to be beginning, be beginning uh, workshops to tr hopefully train individuals. And even if people aren't are actually offering the therapy, I'm hoping that if they if they come and learn about the, the treatment, clinicians will be taking back some of the philosophy uh, to their work and be thinking about addressing the needs of the whole person. So thinking beyond just the physical and symptomatology and thinking about the distress that can come in other areas and giving patients an opportunity to talk about those issues. Um, Okay, great, thank you. And uh, is the program only for people who have been newly diagnosed with cancer or can somebody who's been living with cancer for a while um, decide that, you know, this might be helpful to them? Sure, absolutely. In fact, um, so the, the intervention is for patients that have advanced disease and we're really defining that in solid tumor cancers as metastatic disease. Um, uh, and so it isn't for patients newly diagnosed who have uh, an earlier stage cancer that's likely uh, treatable and curable. Uh, certainly, I, I think a lot of these issues and, that we've discussed may be pertinent to those patients, but it is a different situation to have a curable disease uh, versus having a, a metastatic disease that is likely not curable. So where it, is, it does target the patients who have um, a life-threatening and non-treatable uh, or non-curable illness. But absolutely, timing nonetheless uh, is variable, and, and certainly have some patients that are appropriate for the treatment. As soon as their metastatic disease is diagnosed, they're at that tipping point that I discussed. They're at that place where they are really being thrust into questioning and distress in all those domains and, and are, would benefit from an opportunity to talk about it. There are other patients who may have been living with metastatic disease for many, many years and, and never really were thinking or facing any of those issues. If, if, as I said earlier, if disease is fairly stable, if there aren't a lot of physical symptoms, uh, if life hasn't changed a lot because of advanced disease, um, patients are not often thinking about issues of mortality, issues of meaning and purpose. It's often when there's a shift either in care or in the, or in the uh, illness, when they become more symptomatic, when there's change, that tipping point is often what leads people to be more interested in this therapy. So timing is very important and we're certainly um, doing our best to try to match people to the right time. Um, uh, when it's beneficial for them, for them, but a lot of that, indicators of that really come from patients themselves, so they can often tell us. When we're recruiting patients, for instance, for our study, we're often asking them, we're saying these are the domains that may be discussed in this therapy, do you have distress in any of these areas, and would you like to discuss these, these issues? So we're asking patients really to let us know if this seems pertinent to them, and in a lot of cases, we'll see patients in clinic who will say, you know what, uh, I feel well and I'm not really thinking a lot about these things and could you connect with me in another few months and see. And so we'll follow people and if, if things change for them down the road and they are more distressed and do want to discuss those issues, then it's appropriate timing for them. Great, thank you. And uh, this calm also provides sessions for their patient's partner um, because there are a few papers on prostate cancer patients uh, showing that the distress levels of their partner can be quite high and maybe higher than the patient themselves. Yes, this is a really, really important point. The, the therapy does, um, inc we do include caregivers in the therapy. So we usually have an initial session with the patient and are often inviting them to bring the caregiver to the next session. And we may have several sessions with the, with the dyad, with the patient and the caregiver. And as I had mentioned earlier, we're really finding that beneficial for a variety of reasons. Firstly, as, as you had mentioned, because the distress is often high in caregivers and are often wanting a lot of support, and because supporting that dyad is often what's most beneficial in terms of long-term coping. But what is interesting is that certainly I know from my clinical experience, we have a lot of caregivers who approach us for psychosocial support and patients, the patient is not interested in that. Um, it's interesting, there's some, some um, question about whether there's some of that's gender specific and so there's often been a lot of discussion about around in the prostate uh, site, you know, is this, is this of 
the same kind of benefit for prostate patients. Are men interested in coming to these intervention for this kind of intervention? And we have found that the same proportion of prostate patients are being recruited for our study as in other sites. But nonetheless, I think it is true that in some cases, caregivers want support and the patient doesn't. And so we are in the process of thinking about um, designing and developing uh, a partnered intervention for caregivers. That that's still in the in the uh, design phase, and so we hope to have some um, preliminary research on that in the next few years. But I definitely think that there we know there's a need out there. Um, and, and we have to think about ways to support uh, caregivers. And, and some of the issues, I think, are similar. They are around manage, certainly managing the illness, issues of meaning and purpose, around anticipation of the future and, and mortality and, and how that it can be frightening for caregivers uh, and the relational changes. Um, and there's a lot that can be explored together. I would say that there are some things that, that caregivers often want to explore without the patient present. So thinking about developing an, an intervention that's specifically for them, I think, is also probably probably necessary. Okay, thank you. And are there any resources that uh, patients and or their caregivers can look at to, to support them? Uh, so in terms of, um, I imagine you're talking about information on the internet or, um, uh, or, or books and that sort of thing, perhaps? Yes. Yeah. Any of those? Yeah. So um, you know what I I I am trying to think about what I would suggest. I'm 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 often loath to to recommend books to people. <laughs> I find books are very very personal. Uh, often, what people respond to and what they find beneficial, uh, and it's often when I know more about the person what they're looking for that I can recommend um, books for them. Certainly, in terms of that around. Um, Managing disease and illness. There is a, there is a um, a website. It's a it's virtual hospice in, uh, in Canada that provides a lot of psychosocial and informational support to patients and their families who have advanced disease. Um, and so that is, I think, a tool that is often really of benefit to to uh, patients and families. They have they have as well a some Ask the Expert programs where you can type in questions. And it can be about, a lot of it is about managing the disease, but a lot of it is about the uh, psychological effects of, the, of, of living with advanced disease, et cetera, and how to manage. And there's also a lot of information about community resources. So virtual hospice on the internet is, is, a, is a resource that I think is often useful for people across the country. Thank you very much. So I can't see any more questions, but if people do think of any more, please do email us at expertangle at prostatecancer.ca. And I just wanted to say thank you very much to Dr. Hale for providing such a thought-provoking presentation tonight and um, to provide that overview of the CALM program. We really appreciate it. Um, for the next webinar, that's going to be on Tuesday, August the 19th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And the speaker will be Dr. Alice Dragomir, and she will be talking about the costs of managing prostate cancer, so the out-of-pocket expenses that people often incur um, when they're diagnosed with prostate cancer. So as always, this webinar has been recorded, and it will be posted on the Prostate Cancer Canada website in the coming days. If you're looking for more information on prostate cancer, please connect with our helpline at 1-855-PCC-INFO or 1-855-722-4636. So thank you so much again to Dr. Hales and to everybody for joining in this evening, and have a good evening. Good night. Good night. Good night.